Uh, I got to say, if uh, if you are uh, if you're uh, too young to remember uh, Y2K, <laughs> you're you're missing out. Um, it, it, you see, uh, I, I've I've known people who have had irrational fears about the future uh, for uh, for a while. Now we don't ever think they're irrational until they pass, right? Uh, but uh, but I remember being in second grade and being taught that in case of a disaster, the best thing to do is for the whole class to push your chair back and hide under the desk. And of course, as a second grader, I'm thinking, this has got to be the dumbest thing ever, <laughs> right? Now, they didn't actually say we're all really, really scared of the Soviet Union launching nuclear weapons at us, but we're pretty sure that hiding under a desk is going to save some people. So, because, I mean, what else are you going to do, right? So, but we were prepared, right? Now, I, you know, I remember, you know, people uh, have been uh, building, uh, uh, you know, bomb shelters and things like that, and I thought that would be great. I mean, I felt unprepared because we didn't have one. We, we didn't even have a basement at my house, and so I figured, you know, uh, my parents must not love us because, uh, you know, in case something really horrible happens. So... But, uh, but when it comes to, uh, to Y2K, I, was, I, I felt like I was much better armed. And, and it, was a, it was a time when, you know, coming from 1999 to 2000, or in case uh, you, uh, you had thought about it too much, you thought maybe it was 2000 to 2001, depending on, you know, when the, the computers were all going to freeze up because it could not handle another digit, and uh, the planes were going to fall out of the sky, and you're and your microwave would stop working. And then you were like, how am I going to heat my food? And this is going to be horrible, and the banking system's going to crash, and, and the government is going to dissolve, and then where will we be, right? You remember any of that? It was amazing. I was like, huh, I kind of remember this. It's just irrational fear of the future, and I don't know what's going to happen. And, and I remember uh, my, my grandmother's church in New Mexico was a little bit on the crazy side, um, and, uh, and I think I've told you uh, recently that, uh, that the uh, youth group spent a lot of time reading Revelation, <laughs> because they're pretty sure that they knew what was coming. But uh, they, they had people that stand up in church and go, you know, if we were really about this, uh, uh, about this whole Jesus thing, we would be burying food in our backyard so that when the government collapsed, we'd be able to feed people. And what are we doing around here? Come on, let's, let's bury some rice and beans in our backyard. And that's, it's like, okay, crazy, <laughs> right? And I, and I, but I remember when we were moving my, uh, my grandmother um, and, uh, and we found... Um, these a, a, a whole horde of these uh, these coins, and I'm like, Grandma, what are these? He goes, Oh, well, those are those are silver dollars, and I'm like, Why why do you have a whole collection of silver dollars? Well, you know, just in case the monetary system falls apart. <laughs> I'm like, it just seemed like a good idea at the time. I'm like, Hey, okay, yeah, I'm all right with that. That's, Seems to be prudent. You might want to try something. Today, uh, we're, I was thinking about that as we were working through the, uh, the scripture we have today. It comes out of the, the book of Luke. We've been taking it one story at a time, and we have been uh, looking at the, the history, the background, and the culture that isn't written into scripture, but this scripture was written uh, from. And so we learn about who we are uh, and about uh, what, who they were 2,000 years ago when we understand what uh, the original author meant to write to the original audience, then we can bring it forward and try to figure out what we're supposed to do with it. And we're going to do that today. We're in chapter 22 of 24. We're getting close to the end. Now, if, uh, if you uh, have been following along, uh, this is the background uh, that, uh, that you need to know in order to understand what we're talking about today. There were these uh, messianic expectations for about 700 years because uh, be uh, God said through his prophets to Israel, you're not doing what I've asked you to do and I'm going to get your attention. In fact, things are going to go really, really wrong for you, but don't worry, I will send a hero that will come in and save you. There will be a savior and, and we call him the Messiah. He's the one that God is going to send to be our hero. Now, 
They've been expecting this guy for 700 years. Jesus then is born 2,000 years ago to Mary. But, uh, but uh, Mary is a virgin, and God has caused her to be pregnant. And so here comes Jesus, and he is different. He is God with us. For this is God who has emptied himself of what it meant to be God and entered into his creation as a human. And so when we talk about Jesus, he came to us different. So we talk about him as being 100% God because he is from God and he is different than we are because of that. He has come in. If you've ever spent any time with a two-year-old, right? The first thing you'll learn is that two-year-olds are all liars, <laughs> right? I mean, bad liars like cookies all across your face and all over your hands. What happened to the cookie? I don't, I don't know, right? Like, but it looks like you ate it. No, I didn't. Now, they will learn to be better liars as they grow, but it's been built into them from the beginning that they have this innate sin thing going on in them. But God didn't. And when he sent his Jesus and sent his one and only son, he came without sin. He faced the same temptations that you and I did, but he didn't give in to them. And because of that, when we find him in chapter 22, he is without sin. So he's 100% God, but he's also 100% human. He, he has the same needs. When he's born, he's born at, with uh, diapers that need to be changed. He's got to be fed. He needs the care. He needs sleep. He still needs to eat. You know, all the, he is 100% human and 100% God. If anyone's trying to do the math, this is theological math, okay? This is, this is different uh, and, uh, and it's really, really difficult because what you have to do is divorce yourself from, uh, you know, logic. But, he's, but when you understand who Jesus is, 100% man and 100% God, he is the new man and he has come for you and me. Now, Jesus is the Messiah, the one that has been prophesied and he is fulfilling all the scriptures. For, for everyone knows that when the Messiah comes, he's going to inspire a nation through his teaching. He is going to heal the sick. He's going to cast out demons. He's even going to raise the dead, doorknob dead, to all the way alive. This is a real and immediate thing. And as he does this, he is going to get this huge following of people. And as Jesus is walking around in chapter 22, the amount of people that follow him, if you're paying attention, might look like an army. And he is the prophesied hero. Although he will not sit on an earthly throne, he will be king. Jesus is also a rabbi. Uh, that means that he is a teacher of the 613 laws found in the first five books of the Bible. Now, because of that, he is an expert in all of this, and he is going to pass on what he knows to as many people that listen to him. But he's also got these graduate students. See, a, a rabbi will receive these graduate students because they want to learn what the rabbi is doing so that they can do what the rabbi does. Now, for Jesus, he doesn't have the best of the best students, but he has picked these guys, handpicked them, and they are going to carry on the tradition that Jesus is teaching them, and they are going to be the, uh, the, the leaders of this new church that is birthed out of, uh, out of his, uh, Jesus' life. Currently, in chapter 22, they're in Jerusalem. They are there for the Passover. Uh, they, Jesus has come into the holy city along with uh, tons and tons of other people. It's at least 2.7 million people, maybe as many as 4 million people within the walls of Jerusalem. We talked about that as possibly being about the size of, uh, of Bidwell Park from, uh, from one mile to five mile with a big wall around it. And think about putting... 2.7 to 4 million people in it. So they are all there. Not, they're not all there sleeping there, but they are eating this meal there, which means they are cheek to jowl. And, uh, and uh, as Jesus has come in, he has been teaching all week in the synagogue 
against the people that run the synagogue, calling them out for all of the, the, the stupid things they've been doing and because they think they're uh, above reproach. And Jesus is saying, those guys are awful and we should do something about it, <laughs> right? Now, that's exactly how they're feeling because the guys that run this, uh, they're, the, they're called the Sanhedrin. There are 70 of them. They've got a, a small army. But if you can imagine this, there are 70 people that run all things Jewish and there are seven, uh, 2.7 to 4 million people there to celebrate a Passover meal celebrating when God rescued his people from a tyrant in Egypt, and they're sitting there listening to Jesus talk about the people that are leading the temple being tyrants, and now these guys are scared for their life because there just aren't enough of them to do anything about it if these guys start to riot, and they want Jesus dead, not just silenced. They want him dead, and uh, they need to figure out how to do that so that they can get him arrested and killed in a timely manner so that they don't have to <laughs> do that with the four million people also watching and possibly writing. So that's why they need Judas. Judas comes in to them and says, hey, I'm one of Jesus' 12 apostles. If you want him, I'll deliver him to you. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. As a matter of fact, that's what we're going to do. So the Sanhedrin is, uh, is thrilled that Judas showed up. They said, this is going to be amazing. We'll even pay you for it. That'll be great. So that's already on the table when we get to the, to the Passover meal that Jesus is eating with all of his disciples there in an upper room within Jerusalem. And Jesus has been uh, teaching throughout this four, four and a half hour meal. And we get to the very end of it. After, uh, after everything's been said, after Jesus has said, somebody around this table is going to betray me, and that's going to be really, really bad for you. And then uh, Jesus says this. This is chapter 22, starting with verse 35. Then Jesus asked them, When I sent you without a purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. Now, if you remember, there was a time not too long before this, when Jesus took those 12 apostles said, hey, you've been listening to what I've been doing and you've been taking all of that in and you want to be able to do what I do, right? Well, right now I'm going to send you out. Send you out of here. Uh, don't, don't prepare anything. Don't take a bag. Don't, take, don't even take uh, you know, power bars or anything. I just want you to go and then go teach what I've taught you to teach and wherever you are received, they'll take care of you. And if somebody doesn't receive your, your message, then I want you to shake the dust off your feet and go to the next place. Because wherever you go, they're going to take care of you when they receive your message. And if you don't find anyone who's willing to feed you a meal, it's because you're not good at this yet. So you should practice. So I don't think that's exactly what he said, but that's exactly what he meant. So uh, they did that for the 12, and then they come back, and then... They, uh, they take the whole group of people down into Judea, which is where they're at right now, and he sent out 72 of them. And the same thing happened. They went out, and God took care of them because every time that they reached a new group of people, they fed them and, and made sure they had everything they needed. They didn't send them uh, away hungry. But they were sent completely unprepared, and they, were, they didn't need to pack for their journey. But now he said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. What? Weird, right? He says, Jesus says, it's better for you to have a sword than for you to be warm. <laughs> it is written, he was numbered with the transgressors, which is uh, quoting out of Isaiah 35, uh, verse, 20, uh, verse 12, and I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment, which means all the stuff I've been talking about is happening right now. The disciple said, see, Lord, here we have two swords. That's enough. All right. So two swords protect all of you. Jesus says dark days are coming for all the stuff that I've been telling you. He has been saying He's going to go to Jerusalem. He is going to go and, and present 
uh, himself in such a manner that he's going to get arrested by the Jews. He's going to be executed by the Romans. And three days later, he's going to rise from the dead. He's been saying this. This has been his plan all along. But now they're here, and, and it's real, and it's ready, and it's right now. So what's happening? He says, I want you to be safe, and dark days are coming. And he's determined to give his own life on a cross. He has not shied away from this one bit. It's not that he has a death wish, and we'll see that today. But he knows that because he has lived a perfect life as God's one and only son, that his life is worth the life of everyone. For if he dies a death he did not deserve, he can offer his death in place of ours, which we do. The Bible says that each one of us has sinned. We have all sinned and fallen short of God's standard. And because of that, I cannot make it to heaven based upon my own behavior. I can't walk enough old ladies across the street or mow enough uh, neighbors' lawns to make up for what I've done. I need Jesus. And so he knows that, and he is sitting there right on the edge of all of this, not shying away from it. But now it's time to prepare. He says, you need to pack for this journey. This is going to be... This is going to be hard, and you're going to have to do this without me. And you need to be ready to defend yourself. You don't need to be ready to, to uh, start rioting. You don't need to start the revolution yourself, right? It, two swords are enough for all 12 of them. He's not saying, make sure that we're all armed because we're going to storm the gates of the castle, right? That's not the way this is going to work. Because the days ahead are fraught with danger because it's going to be unknown and uncertain, and this is going to be... It's going to get ugly. It's going to get ugly really quickly because it begins right now. You see, Jesus is going to leave that city that has four million people in it that are all on his team, that are all ready for revolution. And the tradition is that you want to stay up on Passover night. You want to stay up as late as possible. You want to party till daybreak. Now, what they want to do is they want to share with each other the, the promises that God has given to them throughout the, the history of Israel and that God is going to continue to do that for them and they are going to share this, uh, this joy about what God has done and what God will do. And that's why they want to stay up all night. So, but they're going to leave the city. They're going to leave the, the comfort of the city and the walls that are protecting them and they're going to go out into the countryside. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and with his, disi and his disciples followed him. So uh, this is probably something that Jesus did every night. He probably wasn't staying in Jerusalem, staying with friends outside the walls. And so on his way back, they're going to stop the same place that he has been, has been his habit, to stop here and pray. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. Huh. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Now, that's, if that's familiar to you, I mean, I, don't, I want this to sound new. I want you to hear what he has to say. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly for his, uh, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. I mean, a lot of times throughout the book of Luke, we have seen him act with the power of God. But this is a very human moment. He has said, I know what my future is, and I know what I'm supposed to do, but if there's another way to do this, I want to do that. Is there any way I cannot go through this today? Right? And I just see this, because he prays, not my will, but yours be done, but if, I don't want to do this. And then God sends an angel to strengthen him. And I can just go, oh, so I'm not getting out of this. Right? It becomes an even more desperate prayer. Come on. There's got to be something else. And he prays that the burden would be lifted, but God begins to strengthen him. And, and I see this, and this is a, uh, 
Uh, this is an image that I've seen all my life about uh, this day when Jesus is sitting there, and it's this very, um, you know, uh, messianic, godlike kind of a, you know, Jesus in a garden praying, and he seems really calm. And I think this does not look like the scene, not my will, but yours be done. This is more like a man who is desperate to not go through this, and he's ready, but he doesn't want to. Jesus does not have a death wish, but he's willing to do it for you and for me. And then he says to the apostles, hey, pray that you will not fall into temptation. I wonder what that is. is it, are they going to be tempted to run when, when it all hits the fan? Maybe, maybe it's that they're going to, uh, to attempt to fight. I mean, they've got two swords after all, right? Let's go get both of those and charge the gates, right? This is silly, right? But they may be, in fact, they probably came to Jerusalem thinking that there was going to be a fight. And maybe it was just that uh, after Jesus is dead, been executed, and it looks like they've lost, that they might just simply walk away from all of it. I don't know what the temptation is that Jesus was thinking these guys were going to face. But I think I've got an idea of what it might look like. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them, get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up. A man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus and kissed him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Huh. So this is the temple guard. These are the guys that the, uh, that the chief priests that run the temple, they're the ones who, uh, uh, that, that are their thug squad. You know, they're the ones that keep, the, uh, keep everybody in line. They're, they're the guys that, uh, that make sure that everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. And it's not the Romans that come to arrest Jesus. Uh, the, the Romans don't take orders from uh, from the chief priests, uh, but the, but the uh, temple guard does. They've got to see him a long way off. I mean, if these guys were paying attention at all, they would have seen him coming because uh, the, uh, the Mount of Olives doesn't have a lot of cover, right? This is not, this is not a place where you can hide that uh, these guys were coming. And I think about it, um, when I was thinking about it this week, yeah, it's like uh, the, the, uh, the old Frankenstein black and white movie where you know, it's the pitchforks and the, uh, and the torches. You see them coming from a long way off if you're paying attention and not sleeping, right? But I, but I wonder about this. It seems like it's all by design that Jesus left the place where he was safe, where everybody would have defended him, and went off to a place by himself with just his disciples, to a place where Judas knew he would be, and Judas is able to lead this goon squad over to arrest him. And you go, really? Really? with the chief priests and everybody else in tow, this huge group of people coming to arrest Jesus out in the countryside where it can be done in peace and silence. And nobody's going to know. When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our two swords? Right? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. These guys are completely unprepared. Jesus just said, make sure you pack your backpack because things are going to get real, right? But they come here and they're here right now and they show up and they're like, hey, maybe we should start swinging. And before Jesus has a chance to answer, and I got to say, Luke doesn't tell us who it is. Matthew doesn't tell us who it is. Mark doesn't tell us who it is. But John is willing to name names, right? John says, yeah, it was Peter. He just takes out his sword and he starts slashing at this guy. He missed him so bad he cut off his ear, right? This is a, a really bad idea. You're just going to make him mad, right? And I'm thinking at this point that you've got to, it's like this is mass pandemonium. This is going to be okay corral style. This, these guys don't have a chance, right? Except... For some reason, Jesus is still in control, and he says this. 
But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Goes, there you go. Now you can arrest me, right? Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers and of the temple guard and the elders who came for him, that's the, the Sanhedrin, right? Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts and you did not lay a hand on me, but this is your hour when darkness reigns, right? I bet he had that in his hip pocket, right? Because he knew. He was teaching against all of these guys all week long, and I can just see them all standing around the outside, and Jesus, while he's teaching, is looking right at them, and they're staring right back at him. And I bet one of them did this. <laughs> right? Watching you. Think you're going to get away with this? I don't think so, you know. We've got a goon squad. Who do you have? A bunch of these disciples, right? Yeah, take out both swords and come after us. <laughs> a bunch of fishermen, right? It's not going to work out for you. Well, yeah, actually, these guys thought that Jesus was going to lead a rebellion. Because he sounded like he was going to lead a rebellion. And they did come there to arrest him to stop this rebellion from happening. And that is a real thing. That's why they came to do this. But Jesus has been talking like a rebel leader all week. And Jesus is here to start a revolution. But it's not going to be with him as king in Israel. It's going to be with him as king of the kingdom of heaven. Because he's going to give his life in payment for the sin of all humanity. And that's going to start a revolution. It's going to be amazing. It's going to start the day that he rises from the dead. But he still has this haunting statement that Jesus said. It's just hanging in the air. He says, Why are you sleeping? He asked. Get up and pray that you will not fall into temptation. Now, I was thinking about this. And if I were there 2,000 years ago, what would it be that I would be tempted by? Well, I got to say, I don't know that I have a really good answer for that. But whatever this temptation is, you know, the things that tempt me are the, the things that tempt you. The thing is, those things can be different. But they all have one thing in common. They have something in common. Now, what Paul says about this uh, a little later when he's writing to the church in Corinth, he says this, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. Which to me sounds like bad news because he says, Whatever you're going through is not unusual. People have done it a long time before you and have been successful. So, he says, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And what Paul means is, you will be tempted beyond what you can handle by yourself, but God is faithful, and with you and God together, you can handle this. This will come. It is not overwhelming. You don't have to give in to it. And he says, But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. And you have a way to get out. And he says this in a way that says, This is coming to you. You will be tempted. This is not if you are tempted. You will be tempted. And the thing is, is we got lots of different kinds of people in this world and all of the temptations are different there are things that you're tempted by that are not appealing to me there are things that i'm tempted by that you're not but i truly believe that all of them are ones that pull us from the thing that we're here to do for if you're a part of the kingdom of god it is our job to invest in the kingdom of god it is our job to work in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is anywhere where God's people are doing God's work. So the day that I say yes to God, for, him to, for Jesus to be my savior, my king, and my friend, the first day I become part of his kingdom, he doesn't simply save me from my sin and leave me where I'm at. He saves me into his kingdom, and I'm a part of his kingdom today. And when I'm doing God's work, that's what he taught me to do when he taught me to pray. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Who does that? Me and you, if you're a part of God's kingdom. And that's what we're here to do. Jesus doesn't mince words. He doesn't say, hey, on the weekends, do you think maybe that, you know, you could show me a little respect and a high five every once in a while? He says, you are a part of my kingdom, and it's your job to work for eternity. Anything that calls me away from the work that I'm supposed to do in eternity is a temptation to do things that don't matter. And I, and, I, and I don't mean to talk disrespectfully about all the stuff that we do that doesn't reach eternity. But I think Jesus does, right? I gotta say, I, I'm, I'm really distracted by shiny things. I like shiny things, right? I think, and, and there's lots of stuff that I wanna do. But when I miss an opportunity to speak into the kingdom of God, when I miss an opportunity because I'm doing something else than something that will last forever. And I got to say, when you think about it, what lasts forever? People and God. But you look around, and God created us as eternal beings. And when you here, don't be tempted. Don't be tempted to run and to do things that seem really important. I mean, I don't want to pick on some of you, but maybe I do. I mean, I see people that, you know, that religiously recycle. <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking, I, I'm okay with that. I think recycling's a great idea. But that's not forever, Right? You want to drive a little car? That's great. Thank you, right? Cat-like reflexes, right? <laughs> I, think, I think it doesn't look fast. Huh? I'm, not, I'm not terribly fast, but I'm quick. <laughs> Things that last forever, invest in those. If you want to put your whole being into something, invest in people that last forever. And not in the stuff that goes away. If you are a follower of Jesus today, I want you to ask God to walk you through this last week. And I want you to ask Him, what did I do last week that made a deposit in forever? That's a scary question, isn't it? But ask it. What is it that you did this last week that made a deposit that lasts for eternity? And then ask God, how do, I, how do I improve that for the week that is to come? And ask that God would use you for the week that is to come to make investments in something that, that will last forever. Now, if you are here today and you say, I don't even know if I'll last forever. I don't, I don't know if I'm a part of the kingdom of God or not. Well, the whole story about Jesus is the story for us. Jesus died on a cross to pay the penalty for your sin. His perfect life in exchange for your sin. And if you ask him, he will become your savior because you can't save yourself. He saves you into his kingdom, making him our king. And we learn to do what the king says. But he's also our friend, and he will walk us through our world, and we get to see this world through his eyes, and we get to see people for who they really are, eternal beings, even the really annoying ones, right? We see them for who they are. Now today... If you are uncertain about where you'll spend eternity, I'm going to say a prayer out loud. If you say it in your heart, God will hear you and make you a part of his kingdom today. That's great news. If today you are, you are a part of the kingdom of God, I'm going to ask you that you would pray that you would not be held by temptation 
to invest in things that don't last forever. Focus on Him. And let Him show you where to put your time and treasure this week. Will you bow your head and close your eyes, just making an altar where you're at? If you're a part of His kingdom today, you pray that prayer. Ask Him to show you your last week and how to improve the week that is to come. But if you're uncertain about where you'll spend eternity, you can say this prayer in your heart. As I say it out loud, God will hear you and make you a part of his kingdom today. Father God, I need you. Be my savior, because I can't save myself. Be my king, and may I learn to do what the king says. Be my friend. Show me my world through your eyes. Thank you for your gift of eternal life that starts for me today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.